So I'd like to introduce now Dr. James Galvin to give his talk on building a better brain. All right, good morning, everybody. Everybody can hear me okay? Uh, usually, I don't need a microphone, but of course I'm gonna use a microphone here. Um, this is a weird setup for me, because one, I usually like a lavalier microphone because I, I like to use my hands and walk around and talk. Now I feel like I'm a stand-up comic and I need to hold a microphone. Um, so we're gonna talk today about how to build a better brain. Um, and we're gonna take sort of a precision medicine approach. Now, uh, just for a, a quick poll, how many people have heard the word precision medicine before? Anybody? A few people, okay. So I'm gonna talk about, this is really the state of where medicine is heading. And I think we can do the same thing to build a better brain. Now I'm gonna show you a bunch of slides. I don't read slides. Some of the slides look very complex. The complexity is so if you wanna read the slides, you can, but I'm just gonna talk through the slide, okay? And I'll point to some things that I think are important. Uh, so Dr. Kleiman already kind of went over what we do. Um, so uh, again, we, we're the Comprehensive Center for Brain Health. That's one of our big missions, um, is to better understand how the brain ages and what puts people at higher risk for diseases like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, strokes, et cetera. Um, we also have a Lewy Body Dementia Research Center of Excellence. Uh, so Lewy body dementia is the second most common form of dementia after Alzheimer's disease. This is the disease that Robin Williams uh, passed away from. Um, and so there are 22 programs around the United States. And I direct the program in South Florida. Um, it's the only program in South Florida. Um, and so we, we do a lot of research about that. And I'm not going to talk about that today. As a preview, our spring conference will be focused on Lewy body dementia. And we're trying to make it a statewide conference so we can invite people from across the state to come and hear about this. Um, busy slide, again, um, this is who we are. Um, I wanted to acknowledge all the wonderful people walking around in black uh, polo shirts who've really done all the work, and they, they really do all the work. I get all the glory, I get to stand up here and talk to you, uh, but they actually do all the work here. Um, we're funded by a lot of grants uh, from the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, and other organizations. So we have 28 grants uh, with our organization. Um, totals over $115 million of money coming in from the government and other organizations to support our research projects. Um, and then we collaborate with a lot of people. Um, and, and so instead of listing them, we took this really interesting way of doing, this is a social network. Um, how many people use social media? Anybody, Facebook, Twitter, anything like that? Well, you can actually look and see how many people you connect with with specialized software. And I had Michael, uh, Dr. Kleiman, make this diagram for me. So in the center is us, the University of Miami, and these are all the different institutions and collaborations we have to support our research. Um, so you can see they take on some very interesting shapes, so we can learn a lot about how we reach out to the world and, and connect. Um, so. What is precision medicine? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, right? So precision medicine is basically a medical model that separates people into different groups, right? Um, and so then medical decisions, practices, treatments can be then tailored, right, to a subgroup of patients based on their predicted response or their risk of disease. Right? So what that means is instead of just doing a one-size-fits-all approach to everybody, we can start to look at people as individuals and as small groups and say, will a certain person respond differently to medicine than other people? Do they express disease symptoms differently than other people? And this is commonly used in oncology, cancer. Um, and, but it can extend to other fields. Um, so what basically in cancer, what they do is they try to take a piece of the tumor and they examine the tumor for all of its markers and then they design medicine treatments based on those markers. Um, if you've seen those commercials, they'll say, you know, if you have uh, stage four non-small non cell cancer and you don't have the ARK gene and you don't have the ERG gene, but you have the PLT2 gene, then you're eligible for this medicine. That's precision medicine, right? That's getting down into the very basics of your cellular makeup and figure out how do we treat people, right? Um, and so the concept a lot of a lot of precision medicine is genome based. And Dr. Nudeman's gonna talk about genetics after me, but the genome is basically all of the genetic information that makes up a person. 
And using that, we can create something called the genotype. We can classify you based on your genes, okay? Um, and you can get this from blood, or you can get this from taking a piece of tissue, like a biopsy, okay? And there are a lot of benefits, because now, using this concept, instead of being reactive, we can start to think about prevention, right? Instead of waiting for disease to happen, we can start to think how we can prevent disease from happening. We can predict who's more susceptible to diseases. Um, we can improve detection. If we could find the right combination of medicines, we might be able to halt progression so that people can be healthier for longer and live longer, happier lives. But most important, it eliminates trial and error. A lot of medicine is, well, I think this medicine may work on you. So take this medicine and come back in three months and we'll see how you're doing on it, right? And, and that's been the tried and true practice of medicine for as long as there have been medications. But the idea of precision medicine is once we try to define who you are, we might be able to eliminate that trial and error and design a treatment pattern that's specific for you. So how do we apply this to brain health? Well, obviously we can't take a piece of the brain, right? That would be, most people wouldn't agree to that, right? Um, if anybody does want to agree to that, the table in the far, no, I'm just kidding. Um, so instead in that, we, would, we call, we phenotype people. So we can't do the genotype because we're not taking pieces of tissue, right? So we're going to phenotype people, okay? And what that means is we're going to look for slight deviations from the normal or expected structure, function, behavior, performance. And we're going to build a pattern of all of these little deviations right, and define who a person is, and then understand what risk they have of disease and what we could do to prevent that risk in that person, okay? So we get a very, very detailed, comprehensive picture. And that's the basis of all of our research. How many people here have done one of our research visits? Yeah, so they're a little long. The reason for that is the more information we have, the better we can classify what is a deviation or a change and understand what risk of disease is. So this gets into this concept. Again, there's a busy slide. I don't read slides. Um, you could read the slide if you want. Um, but, uh, but this gets to this concept of resilience versus vulnerability. Okay? Um, so resilience means the ability of an organism, in this case a person, to resist the effects of disease, even if they have some signs of the disease, okay? So, you know, for example, uh, some people had COVID, they tested positive for COVID, but didn't have any symptoms. That would be, a resi that would be an example of resilience, okay? Um, people in the, in the old days with, you know, pandemics like typhoid, people have heard the term like typhoid Mary, Typhoid Mary was a carrier of disease, so she had the disease, but never manifested any symptoms of the disease. Now that's a bad thing in case of typhoid fever, but it gives us a sense of how people might be resistant to disease. Vulnerability is the exact opposite. What puts people at a higher risk of developing a disease? And if we understand the difference between resilience and vulnerability, we can start to figure out, well, how can we study this, and how can we use this to improve people's brain health? So one of the big things I want to focus on is this concept of prevention, right? We spend way too much time talking about disease and death and disability, and we spend way too little time talking about health, vitality, and capabilities, right? And so the goal of the Comprehensive Center for Brain Health is to really shift the topic of conversation from not waiting for people to show up in our office already manifesting disease but can we figure out who's at risk and try to prevent them from ever developing the disease? And we can do this in a lot of different ways. We can do this in something called primary prevention. That means get you before there's any signs of any disease at all and try to stop you from ever developing the disease. That's hard, but it's possible. It's raining out. Um, <laughs> you're, aren't you glad you're all inside? It's nice and dry. Um, uh, there's secondary prevention, and that is to try to reduce the impact of disease that's already started, right? So, you know, there's some changes in the brain. There might be a little bit of, in case of uh, memory problems, there might be a little bit of a memory issue, but it's not interfering with your everyday activity. Can we halt it in its steps and prevent it from getting any worse? 
And then there's tertiary prevention. This means even people who have disease, right? Even people who already have Alzheimer's disease, or already have Lewy body disease, who already had a stroke, who already have Parkinson's disease. Can we limit the disability associated with that, that disease by halting the symptoms where they are and trying to keep maintain people's uh, brain health? So this is a fancy slide. I'm gonna point on this one. So this was a study we've done, I keep saying just a few years ago, but as I get older and older, the few years ago has become longer and longer and longer. So now it, it's now almost 20 years ago, right? Um, so I think I had hair at that point. Um, but this was a study where we looked at people um, who came into our project, just like the projects that people are participating in here. This is when I was in Washington University in St. Louis. And we followed people over time. And some people, the top line, were people who came in as healthy controls and stayed healthy controls the entire time they were in the project. Okay? The other two lines are people who came in as healthy controls but eventually developed Alzheimer's disease, okay? And you can see in the beginning, they look the same. But at some point, something starts to change. There's an inflection point, okay? And by understanding that inflection point, we can start to understand, well, what are the earliest signs of disease? And if we can find those things, we potentially can intervene. So this allows us now to look at a period from when there's some inflection to when they're diagnosed, okay? So that means we have this sort of preclinical stage. That's important, it's a weird word, but it means they have changes in their brain, but they don't yet manifest symptoms of those changes, right? And if we could do something at that point, we might be able to change the entire face of the disease. So again, this gets into this concept that we could do some primary prevention, people who are healthy who stay healthy, secondary prevention, people who have brain changes but don't have symptoms yet, and tertiary prevention for people who already have symptoms, okay? So as a scientist, we like to build models. Models are helpful because they help us sort of conceptualize our research, okay? So I'm gonna make you all a scientist now, right? So for the next couple of minutes, you're all going to be neuroscientists, okay? So you're sitting in your office, and the patient shows up in your office and you diagnose them with Alzheimer's disease or some related disorder. So that's the clinical presentation of the disease. But as a scientist, you know that before you diagnose them, they had some symptoms, they had some changes, which is why they came to the office to begin with, okay? And as a scientist, you know before there are symptoms, there have to be changes in the brain, right? So the connections, how brain cells talk to each other, start to break down, okay? So you have neuronal injury and then degeneration. And that may occur five to 10 years before symptoms begin. But as a scientist, you know that's not really the whole story, that before that, they have the things like plaques and tangles forming in their brain. That's the pathology, the findings at autopsy of Alzheimer's disease. That may begin 20 years before there are clinical symptoms. But as a scientist, you know that's not really the root cause. The root cause are what are the risk factors that lead to the development of amyloid and tau, plaques and tangles, that starts the cascade of Alzheimer's disease. And of course, risk factors accumulate across your entire life. But as a scientist, you also know that even people who are diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease don't just have plaques and tangles. They have lots of other things going on in their brain. They have other pathologies, right? They may have small vascular lesions. They may have inflammation. They may have Lewy bodies. They may have lots of other things that we could spend hours talking about. But suffice it to say, they have other pathologies. Now, if you think about this, if they're different than plaques and tangles, then they must have different risk factors. So let's call that risk factor B, okay? So we think about the disease in a very, very different way. If we wanna try to prevent or treat these diseases more effectively, we need to think about the person as a whole, right? So all of our approaches are what we call holistic. That's holistic spelt with an H and with a W, right? 
So we think about you as a total individual and everything about you. And everything that happens below your neck is going to affect what happens above your neck. Right? Um, and so this is, the, this is why we have this comprehensive approach. So there's this nice cartoon that was published a couple of years ago, but it basically says how we potentially can build a better brain as we get older. Um, so in the beginning of this cartoon is early life, and we know that education plays an important role in brain development. Right? The more formal schooling people have, the stronger their brain connections can be. Right? Um, and in midlife, we start doing things because we're working, we're adults, we live independently, um, and so we get ourselves in trouble sometimes. So we may smoke, we may drink, um, we may have head injuries from the, the exercises or things that we do. Um, we could develop diseases like diabetes or hypertension, and these accumulate over the course of a lifetime. What's important about this is there are things that we have no control over, right? I can't control your age, I can't control your sex, I can't control your family history, okay? Um, and that explains um, about 60% of your total risk of developing a brain disease. I can't control that, right? My advice, if you could go back in time, is pick your parents well, <laughs> okay? But assuming that you can't do that, then that 60% we can't change. So I'm not worried about that, but 40% 40% of the risk of developing a brain disease are things that are under our control. There are things that we can do about, we can do something about it, right? And that's the basis of our very comprehensive assessments, to understand everything about you and figure out how we can develop a plan to preserve your brain health. So, it's never too late. It's never too early, but it's better to be too early than to be too late. Um, a busy slide, this gets you some sense of the numbers. And I'm just going to point out one of these numbers, but it's true for a lot of things. There are a lot of things we know increase the risk of disease. For example, if you're a current smoker, right, that increases the risk of Alzheimer's disease by 60%, 60. Six okay? That means that roughly five million cases of Alzheimer's disease worldwide could be explained solely by smoking, okay? And if we could just have 25% of people stop smoking, we could reduce the number of cases by nearly a million, okay? The same is true for obesity, for diabetes, for exercise, for low educational attainment. Um, for major depressive disorder, for hypertension, for hypercholesterolemia, right? And the fact is, when you think about a person as a person, there are very few people that only have one of these things, right? People generally have lots of different things going on in their lives, right? And so think about people comprehensively allows us to address the problem. So this gets to the Healthy Brain Initiative. And our basic question that we ask is, why do some people develop these diseases and others don't? The Alzheimer's Association publishes a report every year. It's called the Facts and Figures. And one of the things they put in the Facts and Figures is that roughly four out of every 10 people at age 85 will have Alzheimer's disease. That sounds scary. Oh, wow, right. But let's flip that equation. That means six out of 10 will not. What can we learn from the six out of 10 that potentially can reduce the number on the four out of 10? Okay? So by studying everything that we study, it allows us to begin to design programs to reduce the risk of developing this disease and build a better brain as we age. Can't see this slide. It's on purpose. We collect a lot of data. Again, anybody who's done our visits know we ask a lot of questions. We do a lot of tests. Each person contributes over 5,000 variables, right, that we look at and consider as we're thinking about how we can approach brain health, okay? And I'm gonna share some of that research now. So one of the things we've been really interested in is understanding this concept of resilience, right? It sounds good, right? What makes us more resistant to disease, but how do you measure it? 
So we spent, this, uh, I jokingly say, this is how we spent our pandemic. Um, we went back and looked at all of our data and started to think about, well, what explains what make, might make differences? So the first thing we looked at is something we call cognitive reserve, okay? And this is what makes the brain connection stronger. And I told you education does, but education is not equal, right? Educational opportunities are not equal for everybody, and education may not be equal. So schools in some areas may not be at the same quality as schools in other areas. So education by itself doesn't explain a lot of things. So we also incorporated occupation, so what people do with their brains, right? So let's use an example. Um, how far in school did Bill Gates go? Anybody know? Harvard dropout, right, in his freshman year, right? So his highest degree is high school. What about Steve Jobs? A Reed dropout. Sarah went to Reed. My son went to Reed. Interesting school. Happy to talk about it on the side. Um, anyway, so, but you would say that their educational attainment doesn't really explain their brain power, right? So what we created was a measure that we can look at education and occupation and get an estimate of how strong the brain connections are. We look at physical activity, we look at mental activity, we look at mindfulness. We're gonna have a mindfulness exercise um, after the second talk, and social engagement. And we put this together to create something we call the resilience index, okay? So this is a measure, a quantitative measure. We can get a number that tells us how strong the brain is, and we can use that number to model research projects. And what we found was that healthy controls, people without memory problems, have higher resilience than people who have memory problems, MCI, who have higher resilience than people who have Alzheimer's disease. And within groups, controls that have higher resilience do better on pencil and paper tests than healthy controls who have lower resilience. So it is actually explaining how our brains work. And the nice thing about this is that everything is modifiable. It gives us an action item that we can address. Likewise, we wanted to look at vulnerability, what makes our brain at higher risk. So we did a, a, a fancy approach called machine learning. Okay, so we use computer programming to help us sort through all of our data and come up with a solution that seems to explain the, the question that we asked. In this case, what makes the brain more at risk for a disease? Right? And then we found a bunch of things. We found age, sex, race and ethnicity, and education. Those things are harder to change. But then we found frailty, uh, obesity, depression, and vascular risk factors like diabetes, stroke, heart disease, hypertension, all of which can be modified. And then when we looked at this, we created this vulnerability index. And again, people with healthy controls have lower vulnerability than people with mild cognitive impairment, who have lower vulnerability than people with Alzheimer's disease. And within groups, controls that have lower vulnerability perform better on pencil and paper tests than controls who have higher vulnerability. So it's telling us a lot about the strength of our brain and their ability to resist uh, disease. We've also developed some fun little tests. Er, some, everybody who's been with us has taken this fun little test. It's called the number symbol coding test. So basically, it looks at our ability to quickly make decisions and solve problems, which is the basis of all of cognition, right? And it doesn't matter what's going on with your brain, whether it's Alzheimer's or a stroke or Parkinson's, executive function, problem-solving abilities, is universally affected. So we have this very, very brief test that allows us to capture this information. Now, what's really nice about this is then we can take our measures of resilience, our measures of vulnerability, and our measures of performance, and put it all together to create a picture of where your brain is compared to everybody else, okay? Um, and so this is really powerful, right? So we are able to then take this information and understand what's happening. For example, if someone has an abnormal resilience 
and an abnormal vulnerability and an abnormal executive task performance, they're very likely to have Alzheimer's disease or a related disorder. If they're normal in all those categories, they're very likely to be a healthy control. And if they fall somewhere in between, that gives us targets of intervention. So we can create a pretty picture, okay? This is a probability distribution, okay? So there are three groups here. The dark blue group are our healthy controls. The purplish group are people with mild cognitive impairment. And the people with the green group are people who have Alzheimer's or related disorders. And this is putting all of these three measures together. Now, why is this important? Because again, we can look at an individual and place exactly where their brain performance is and design a plan going forward. Um, we have lots of other tests that we do. Uh, we try to ask what you think about your brain performance. So we ask questions. We ask questions, what do you think about your own brain health? Uh, we have complementary tools looking at how much green space exposure you have, um, personality, mood, sleep, how your life has changed over the course of your lifetime, stress, discrimination. So these things all play into how our brain ages. Um, so this again allows us to build models. We can think about things that increase our brain health and things that decrease our brain health and gives us buckets to act upon. Okay, so how do we apply this in real life? Okay, so I don't know how many of you play cards. Anybody play cards? Yeah, right. So most of you play cards with other people, right? So picture your little card group sitting around the table. We have four people here, right? Um, so our first gentleman, he likes fried foods. He's a little overweight, as you can tell, but he does enjoy in playing his games. He has high blood pressure. He has no memory complaints. His partner next to him um, exercises daily. She plays games. She takes no medications, um, and she has no memory complaints. The person next to her has very little physical activity. She does play games. Um, she has medicines, but she's not very good at taking them. Um, and she, in fact, does have some mild memory problems. Uh, and our last gentleman, who I call Smiley, um, exercises sometimes. He does play games. Um, he has diabetes, which he is managing. And he has some memory concerns. Okay? So four people, they're all playing games. Right? We test them then. We give them that number symbol coding test. And they all get the same exact score. Okay, so what does that tell us about someone? Well, that just tells us they all scored the same exact score, right? How do we put that in perspective to understand how we approach each individual? Well, we look at their resilience and their vulnerability. Now you can see that they're quite different, right? So our first gentleman who likes the fried foods, um, he plays games, so he has good resilience, but he also has pretty high vulnerability. Right? He's overweight, he doesn't eat well, he doesn't exercise, um, it puts him at a higher risk. Our happy lady who doesn't have any memory complaints, she has very low vulnerability and very high resilience. The woman who has memory problems has high vulnerability and low resilience. And Smiley has low vulnerability but also low resilience. Okay? Remember, they all scored the same but their underlying risk and vulnerability of disease is different. So now we can put them into perspective, okay? So the little star represents where each person lives in our paradigm. So our first gentleman, even though he's a healthy control from a test perspective, his brain looks like someone who has mild cognitive impairment which means if we did nothing for him, he would probably eventually to go on to develop a disease like Alzheimer's disease. Our healthy woman, you can see that she looks great. Her brain looks right at the edge of normal, the far edge of normal. She's a super ager, right? She's a super ager. If you go talk to Susan Fox Rosalini, raise your hand, Susan. We have a, a network called the Precision Aging Network. That might be something if you're a super ager you might want to participate in. 
The woman who has memory problems, you look where her star is, and she clearly falls in the pattern of people who have Alzheimer's disease. Okay? And then likewise, Smiley is at higher risk. So again, a pencil and paper test, you would walk away saying, you're all fine, go home, come back in six months. But we know that's not the case. Because by understanding their underlying brain performance, their vulnerability, their resilience, we can start to design personalized plans. So let me do this in the real world. So this is a real person who let me use his data. Uh, as a gentleman in his late 70s, past medical history significant from coronary heart disease, and he has a lot of vascular risk factors. He has no memory complaints. He has no change in his everyday functioning. He's physically active, although all his physical activity is exactly the same. He walks on a treadmill. Right? That's his only physical activity. Uh, he eats, but not quite as well as he probably should. Um, he has no history of sleep problems, but he wants to do everything to reduce his risk of Alzheimer's disease. So he comes in for the assessment. Um, this is a shorter assessment than you guys are doing. Um, this is an online assessment that we've developed. Um, and, and so it took him about 20 minutes to answer all the questions. Um, so he has good cognitive reserve. He has advanced care planning in place. His general health is rated as good to excellent. Um, he has a fair amount of green space exposure. He doesn't spend that much time outside. He's functionally independent. Um, he has limited physical activity. He has limited cognitive activity. His diet score is not very good. He doesn't eat a lot of green vegetables, nuts, berries, whole grains, uh, eating a lot of processed foods. He has no subjective complaints. Um, he's not very mindful. Um, he has minimal mood symptoms. So putting them all together now, we can start to see that his resilience index is 187. So that's above the threshold. That's good. But his vulnerability index is 10. That's above the, in that's above the threshold. That's not good. Okay? His number symbol coding test was 43. So this puts him right in that intermediate risk. Right? So even though he's a healthy control, his brain is at risk for developing a disease. So then we can then take this and do a personalized prevention plan. Okay? So even though his overall cognition is normal, what can we do to help him build a better brain? We identified problems. He has low mental activities, low m mild mood symptoms. Uh, he's not very mindful. He has a history of coronary heart disease. His vascular risk score is intermediate, puts him at a higher risk for future vascular events. Um, he doesn't make the best food selections. He has some muscle loss. Um, and he doesn't do anything except walk on a treadmill. So we can start to break him down into having cognitive risk, vascular risk, metabolic risk, and markers that tell us that his brain is at, at, at risk. And we can design a personalized plan. Okay? So don't focus on his personalized plan, because his personalized plan is personal for him. But the fact is, by doing this really deep phenotypic characterization, we can say, for that individual, what puts him at risk, and what could we do to build a better brain? I just wanted to give you just a survey of some of the really great things that we do at the center, right? So this top panel, uh, this is using some principles of chemistry. How many people took chemistry in college? Yeah? Um, so we used the Michaelis-Menten um, uh, equation, which basically was for catal catalysis, looking at enzymatic reactions, and we apply that to cognitive testing and saying, how do vascular risk factors increase the risk of dementia in people who are not white, right? Uh, so in African Americans and Hispanics who are, seem to be at a higher risk for disease, how do vascular risk factors really play a role? And so we're able to, to understand this. We use some machine learning to take large databases of images and decide how people transition. So what makes someone progress slow? What makes someone progress fast? And then we can find some ge genetic signals that tell us who's going to progress slower or faster. And so this is under further investigation. Uh, we look at the eyes. Um, so the eye is actually a window to the brain. The back of your eye, your retina, is actually brain tissue. So it's the only place we can actually look at the brain. I can look through your eye and see a piece of your brain, your retina. So we have these fancy machines 
One's called optical coherence tomography. Now, ophthalmologists use this to look for glaucoma and macular degeneration. What we're looking for is to try to understand people's risk of Alzheimer's disease. And then the other machine is called a confocal scanning laser ophthalmoscope. Fancy word. But what we can do with this is we can actually image amyloid in the eye. Right? So we're developing these projects where we might be able to screen people for Alzheimer's disease using these two devices, which take about four or five minutes, as opposed to thousands of dollars of PET scans. Um, Dr. Kleinman mentioned one of our studies is interested in walking. So this is using just walking, nothing else, just watching people walk back and forth on a computerized gate mat. And we use these machine learning principles. And the machine, without us telling the machine anything, was able to pick out who was a healthy control, who had mild cognitive impairment, and who had Alzheimer's disease just by the way they walk. This is some really cool research by Dr. Besser, who's in the back. Raise your hand, Lila. There's Lila in the back. Um, so she's an urban planner, and so she's using satellite imaging to understand our lifetime exposure to green space and tree canopy and how that might affect our brain health. And what we found is people who have lower exposure to green space have smaller brains and worse cognitive performance, right? So again, this gets the idea of how we can do urban planning um, to improve our overall health. I'm gonna take questions at the end, sorry, okay? Um, and then the last thing is some work that uh, one of our new colleagues, Dr. O'Shea, I'm trying to find her, where is she, where is she, where is she? There she is, she's raising her hand. So she just joined us, um, and so she's interested in something called epigenetics. You're gonna hear a lot about genetics next. But she's interested in epigenetics, which is basically modifying your DNA, and this, this turns on and off switches for different signals. And so she's actually worked with groups and used something called a, a epigenetic clock, right? And using that clock, she can look at people who are likely to biologically age faster or slower and whether there's differences between men and women. So this is some of the really cool work that we're doing at the center. So just to summarize, precision medicine approaches are really going to change the way we think about brain disorders, right? We're gonna go away from the one size fits all approach. And we're gonna look at you as an individual and what we can do for you to make you the best you you can be, okay? Um, this brain health platform that I described can quickly and accurately identify even the mildest uh, impairments and un help us better understand a person's risk. This helps us paint a very detailed picture of an individual's susceptibility and resistance to cognitive impairment, okay? But as we incorporate all of these other markers, we're gonna be able to fine tune this further and further and further so that we can approach the same thing that the cancer field has done for cancer for brain disease. And at s so people who make an investment in their brain health, just like we make an investment in our financial health, people who make an investment in their brain health, performing resilience activities, reducing their vulnerabilities, this may help maintain your brain structure and function, and this could translate into greater resistance of developing brain diseases. And at CCBH, we are spearheading really novel approaches to develop and test new diagnostics and new therapeutics, to innovate the way we practice clinical medicine, and to improve the lives of our patients and their families. I wanna thank you for your attention. I hope you found this informative. Um, this is how you can contact us.